no Mickey show. The no Mickey show. Yeah, uh huh. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Mickey Show. Uh. The No Mickey Show.
flash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The no Miki show. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show. Nomiki Show. I am Nomiki Kans. It is Wednesday, May 19th. And as of today, there has been a lot of self-congratulations about the economy roaring back. So let's take a moment and ask, roaring back for whom? It's simple. The economy is roaring back for those who had capital to begin with. If you own stock, if you owned a house, you are sitting pretty right now. The banks are raking in, even companies that took a hit like rental cars and cruise lines are on the comeback. In fact, and I speak to this for, for personal experience, there is a shortage globally of rental cars. Hertz, which went bust right before COVID, is now a hot property again. 
which is great if you own a share of Hertz, but not good at all if you just need to rent a car. You know, this is interesting because I uh, had to rent a car <laughs> here on the island, and I thought it had something to do with the tourism boom that is occurring post-COVID with the COVID economy um, on the island of Puerto Rico. And it actually did not have to do with that, at least exclusively, because it's happening globally. Right before the pandemic, uh, rental cars found themselves, rental car companies found themselves uh, going bust. And then simultaneously, car production went down during the pandemic. And so people during the pandemic, once they started to figure out uh, how to, 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 to go on vacation uh, and socially distance, they were renting cars and buying cars, but there weren't enough. And there weren't enough chips being produced for these cars. And so now, if you have the capital, you can get a car, you can buy a car, you can rent a car, but there is a shortage. The, 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 the rates right now are through the roof. Used cars, even more than new, new cars. And guess who buys those used cars? Working people. For ordinary working folks who live paycheck to paycheck, like myself, this past year has been a nightmare and it is still a nightmare. If you were one of the lucky ones who could keep your job and work remotely, may have come out okay, but most likely you're still struggling. You are stir crazy, but solvent. But if you were in a job that required customers to actually show up, like a restaurant or a hotel or a barber shop, or you were on one of those factory lines that was producing cars, you were screwed. Now the government did send you some checks. If you paid your taxes two years prior, if you qualified, if your tax qualified two years prior to the pandemic, and they did enhance unemployment insurance. And that may have cushioned the fall, but it was hardly lucrative, contrary to Mitch McConnell's claim. So the rich got richer and more liquid, and the rest of us were left to struggle on. No real surprise. But let's not lose the reality in all this celebrating. We are living in a time of grotesque inequality, and this pandemic has absolutely made it worse. We know how dangerous COVID was and is, but I still don't think that the country has absorbed how dangerous the gaping inequality was before and what it is about to turn into. This is what corrodes democracy with a lowercase d. This is what leads to fascism. This is what led to fascism. This isn't Nomi Key speaking. This is history speaking. We know that the most dangerous moments for democracy are after terrible traumas, wars, pandemics, when the pre-existing unfairness is brought home with a vengeance and the sense of hope is in tatters and the leadership failures have demolished trust. Sound familiar? Well, that was, that was Europe actually a hundred years ago, but it is the United States today. If we act like everything is just coming back to normal, we better remember that normal was pretty bad. And what we have at this moment is even worse. I'm worried that everyone is so eager to let the good times roll, trust me, I feel it, <laughs> that we aren't seeing all the wounded and damaged lives around us and the trauma. And we haven't even processed the deaths. We can do better and we must do better. There's an economy right now, a post-COVID economy that we haven't even grasped. We're, we talk about uh, the eviction crisis and how we're just postponing the eviction crisis. We're talking about how People can't have access uh, to capital, uh, how they're not, the debts that people have ensued, whether it's the pre-existing student loan debt, credit card debt that people have been living off of. We have no sense of how bad it is, how much people have had to do to survive over the last 16, 17 months. But simultaneously, you're seeing communities disrupted like here in Puerto Rico right now, but it's happening across the globe where the rich are coming in and seizing opportunities to buy land, to buy out all the hotel rooms, to buy out all the Airbnbs, which disrupts the economy, economies locally. And the rates go up to unbelievable levels. Taking all of the rental cars, buying up all the car stock because they have the capital to do so. How does that change? This is beyond gentrification. This is rapid exploitation as people are already suffering in communities across the country, whether you're in New Orleans, whether you're in Detroit, whether you're in Buffalo, whether you're in New York, or whether you're in San Juan, Puerto Rico. There are too many people who are already struggling before the economy collapsed under COVID. And now the rich who have the luxury to just swoop in 
and buy things up and move places at their own convenience are disrupting, disrupting whatever stability still existed. Communities are falling apart. They were falling apart. So what are we going to do with this new COVID economy? What are we going to do to protect what little stability was there? How are we going to protect our working people? And I don't mean working, I mean working people. Anybody who relies on a job to pay their bills, how are we going to protect their homes, their communities, the rapid, it's not gentrification, it's, it's billionaireification of their communities. What are we going to do to prevent the wealthy from taking advantage of those who are just trying to get by? All right, we have a wonderful show today. It's jam packed. Julia Doubleday is here. She's going to be a little bit on a little bit later with Simon Road to talk about some of the news, some of the international news that's happening today. Uh, Brianna Westbrook is, Brooke is here as well. She's going to talk about her new pack uh, to promote progressive actions in state legislatures. And then right after this, we have Ronnie Patrice. She's going to be talking about Palestine. Uh, have you heard the latest? President Biden called Prime Minister Netanyahu again this morning. Ten days into Israel's brutal war on Gaza, Biden told his friend, Bibi, it was time to, quote, de-escalate and head towards a ceasefire. At least 227 people have been killed by Israeli strikes in Gaza, including 64 children, not to mention, we know, the attacks on journalists, right? A Palestinian journalist was killed by an Israeli strike. Two Thai agriculture workers were killed in Israel by a rocket from Gaza. Okay, but you think this is time to de-escalate, de Mr. President? It, it should have happened before. It should have happened years before, as we know too, too, too well. All right, we will be right back after this break to discuss. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, I am so excited to welcome Rania Batrice. She is a dear friend. She is uh, here to discuss Palestine. She's a strategist, though, at the intersection of politics, policy, and, and advocacy. Uh, she works in communications, mediating, organizing, and legislative strategy. Off, you know, she, she advises like everybody across the board. But uh, you probably remember her from the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016. She was the deputy campaign manager. She has served as executive director of the Innocence Project of Texas and the Freedom Project, which is an anti-human trafficking, anti-domestic violence, and women's empowerment organization. She's still on the board there. She's also on the board of Matriarch. Uh, but relevant to today, she's first-generation uh, Palestinian-American. Her parents are both Palestinian, and we've had plenty of conversations about this. But, Rania, welcome to the show. But I want to I start with, um, I remember you saying that you joined the Bernie Sanders campaign because of his position on Palestine. Do you want to kind of like, let's flat, I mean, it's so easy for all of the movement now to be like, well, this is the right way to go, but let's go back like five, six years ago and, and how courageous it was for any candidate, let alone Democrat, running as a Democrat presidential candidate to take that stand on Palestine. So I, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, first of all. And uh, and and I, I have to say before we dive in that there are movement people, friends of ours who are who are not uh, who are not with us on this, this even now, even today, when it does seem very obvious and very clear. And we have organizations like Human Rights Watch putting out reports that very clearly say Israel is an apartheid state and naming every one of their human rights abuses, and let's be clear, the Israeli government, um, there are people who are progressives who are um, pushing back very heavy on that. And we, we can talk about that a little bit more later, but I, I just wanted to name that because it's still courageous in a lot of ways. Um, but to your point, yes, Bernie in, uh, in 2016 and, and even before was, um, one of the only people, if not the only person on that slate that 
was actually speaking um, courageously and honestly, quite frankly, about the injustices being carried out against Palestinian people and funded by this government, by the United States government. Uh, and I, I posted something today just about how this is not, you know, this is decades and decades and decades in the making. There has not been an administration to, to take on the issue in an honest uh, way. And, and we're seeing that of course still today, but Bernie then and still now is, uh, is, is an advocate and an ally and, and just speaking up on, on our behalf in ways that um, that are so important, and of course to his own detriment too, because it's it's always interesting when the when the Jewish man is called anti-Semitic. So anyway, <laughs> Jewish man who lived in a kibbutz yeah. is called anti-Semitic. That right, was a different Israel. That was a different yeah. Israel, right? right. Um, I, <laughs> I, I do. I do think there's something really interesting happening right now, and there's a sea change um, in conversation. And I think many people are attributing it to just the rising progressive uh, generational force that's 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 coming of age. But simultaneously, they're saying, "Okay, social media." But I want to ask, just there is also just like a demographic shift in this country. In the last 20, 25 years, um, there's been a larger population of Muslim Americans that have come. Children of, I mean, from multiple communities who who align with being pro-Palestine for, for many reasons. And I don't think that's being discussed enough, just like how the demographics of this country have shifted, which has in part led to people like Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar being elected uh, or, or, or Keith Ellison being elected um, it, when it couldn't, probably couldn't have happened demographically like 25 years ago. Am, am, is there some truth there or is that just my oh, yeah. I mean, armchair? I asked- analysis. I, I think there's definitely some truth there. I do want to just point out though, um, that all Palestinians are not Muslim. All right, Muslims no, are not Arab, okay, you know, yes, yes, um, yes. I, members of my family are Muslim, but in lots of my family is also Catholic. And so right. it's just like, you know, important and not that it should matter to be really right. blunt and honest, it shouldn't matter. But when we see so much of the pushback coming from the evangelical population, I kind of just want to shake them and be like, guess what, you know, because they so often don't know. Um, but but to your point, yes, I, I do think that there is a demographic shift. There's also, I feel like th- these youth movements that we've been seeing um, that are so powerful all across the country and around the world, quite frankly, uh, that have moved the narrative as well. They're so, it's one of the things you and I have talked about this before. It's one of the things I love about young people. They have loyalty to no one, <laughs> you know? Because no one's been there for them. <laughs> well, it, but also they just, you know, they don't care if yeah. if if we're lifelong Democrats or what, or, or, or they don't care. They are about humanity. They are about the planet. They just are like, are you with us or not? Cool, we can talk. And if not, then then they're going to, you know, they're going to have that blunt conversation. So I do think that that's a big part of it. And I will also say as, as gutting as this uh, time has been, and again, it's not new, uh, the, the most outreach that I have gotten just to check on me or to see how they can help or, you know, all those kinds of things have been from Jewish allies, Mm -hmm. which is also very interesting um, and and wonderful <laughs> and keep kind of gives me courage to keep going. I don't want to. I I do have a lot of amazing friends who've reached out uh, otherwise as well who are not Jewish. Mm-hmm. But I do want to name that because um, I we're seeing a lot of the not in my name kind of thing and and people who are um, descendants of Holocaust survivors or victims of the Holocaust who are saying my family did not survive this or did not get mm-hmm. get through this atrocity just for us to then turn around and oppress another people. And so it, I do think it's there's a lot of different dynamics at play here. Um, of course, it is a complicated issue. I, I kind of want to pull my hair out when people say that. And here I am just saying it. It is, it is complicated in that it is not in, in the same way that um, indigenous sovereignty in this country is complicated. I mean, this nation was built on stolen land yeah. and no one is saying, okay, we're all going to mass exodus the United States and give it back to our native siblings 
but we are saying justice must be served and self-determination must be a priority. And there are so many intersections between that and what's happening in Israel as well and in the occupied territories. There is this narrative that, oh, you know, they, that we want, we, because I am Palestinian, so I'm going to say we, want to wipe Israel off the map. And it's such a BS <laughs> narrative. So this is, this is interesting because I, I mean, I'm sure we both have friends that are uh, identify as progressive and probably even in Israel are, um, I'm speaking personally of people that I know from Israel, who identify as progressive in Israel, who condemn the Netanyahu government, the right wing, um, here stand with Black Lives Matter. Uh, you'd probably support like Elizabeth Warren. I'm not going to go as far as say Bernie, but um, I've been really kind of surprised to see. I've gotten messages from them, and I resist responding. Frankly, um, there is this. It's 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 they condemn the behaviors of Netanyahu, but they still buy into this Hamas mindset. And so I want to kind of like break that apart a little bit and get into the weeds here about where Palestinians generally stand. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, you can never generalize anybody, but what is, what is the relationship between Hamas and the Palestinian people? And I mean, of course, that's the excuse that the Israeli government gives. And I mean, we see the videos where, where kids on the street are like, I don't even, they're like throwing rocks. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's I, I'm watching. Well, and let's things. be honest, Israel bombed the AP building in yes. Gaza. Like, yeah. tell me again how you're, you're micro, you know, you're targeting and all. It's no, so no, no, strong. No. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah, like, I don't know it was Hamas. Like you didn't know it was the AP. I, that's what we said yeah. yesterday. Like they no, knew very it, well. It, that was a, that was a, uh, we are too big for. We're, we're too powerful that they're never going to condemn us for this and totally, we can get away with it. Absolutely. And I, I, I think you bring up a really, really, really important question. And um, somebody said uh, recently, Hamas could disappear today and Palestinian people would still be oppressed. Mm -hmm. Hamas came into power. And again, let's be clear, the Israeli government helped me and the U.S. government, quite frankly, but helped to make that happen. That didn't happen until the 80s and 90s. And, and, and when was Palestine, Israel founded? Exactly. 1948. And let me tell you, I grew up with my grandmother telling me the stories of being driven off their land. And my other grandmother telling me about how they were actually told to just take, they were doing water quality tests and to just yeah. take, um, you know, a couple days worth of clothes and they literally burnt her village to the ground. So I, I, this, it is again, a false equivalency, a completely false narrative that, that Hamas is the issue. That being said, you would be hard pressed to find a Palestinian civilian who is supportive of Hamas or their ideology. I mean, and, and I think that is a really, really important point because with all this like what aboutism that happens and we're seeing today, there, and I often say, listen, do you want to be judged on the basis of Donald Trump? I know I don't, you know, but this country elected him. And, and the same thing with George W. Bush. We like to, you know, pretend like that was the glory days or something. And mm. the reality is a lot of what we've kind of come into. There's a lot of different reasons, but that was an atrocious administration as well. I didn't want to be judged for that administration either. And. Um, anyway, so it's it's just absolutely absurd. It's it, it's hypocritical, and uh, and deeply disappointing. Is to your point, you know, I, the the messages from the friends um, uh, and and the what aboutism and the excuses are it's it's sort of like you expect it from certain sides of things. Not to get too uh, too overly political here, but when it's sort of your friends and your allies and, and the people who will call me first when they want to do something in the justice space in the U S are also the ones who are making me justify my existence and the existence of my family and my people. And it's just, and, and it's totally lost on them. So then you're sort of like, you know, do I continue banging my head against this wall? Well, and it's like, let's, let's just be clear. Like the, the reason why, I mean, from my, from my perspective, and I'd love to hear the reason why Biden is even, kind of speaking out after, of course, he sent military aid. Let's remind folks of that yeah. just two days ago. And 
but he's moving so quickly because the outrage is so extreme, partially because Donald Trump was just so over the top. I mean, yeah. he helped kind of facilitate this by, by, by Netanyahu's sort of buddy buddying up with him, made it so that Netanyahu is now toxic, like in a way that he wasn't four or five years ago with the neoliberals. Like, it, it, like it, they did it to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. When it's really, I, I, you almost have to laugh so you don't cry. I mean, but Donald Trump was the most useful idiot to Benjamin Netanyahu to, mm -hmm. I mean, like it was so clear, but you know, what's really incredible is there are, there are Democrats across this country running for office right now who are copying and pasting Donald Trump talking points on Israel. Mm. And that is disgusting to me. And I, I know some people can separate emotion and all. I'm not, obviously not that person. You know that. Um, <laughs> I am just, I, I can't fathom, wrap my head around. I don't understand where exactly did, did reality just drop so far off that there are people within the Democratic Party who are cool with that. They're okay with that. And I'm not um, exaggerating. They went on an APAC like conference to Israel and okay. they drank a lot of wine and partied in Haifa and it was just like yeah. so much fun. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Sold. Yeah, absolutely. But, but then, you know, and there's a lot of money and, and I'm sure you've, you've probably seen this too. The settlers that are being funded to go steal the land and the homes of Palestinian people, that funding in large part is coming from corporations and entities in the United States. And it's just, it's really, really incredible. Um, so do you think this is a sea change? Uh, I, I think, I hope so. I'm, I'm, I sort of vacillate between being a little bit hopeful and, and getting, like I said, the messages from, from Jewish friends uh, and, and allies and feeling like, oh my gosh, like this is such a big deal that even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have seen this to feeling completely helpless and devastated at, uh, at the commentary. And, and again, just you were mentioning the Biden administration and we're just seeing it's more of the same, you know, and, and thankfully we, we see AOC speaking out. It's just a resolution, but it's still a resolution yeah. to, to stop the additional arms sales because that's yeah. what Israel needs is more bombs. Right. And, you know, so we're seeing these things and even I, I feel like I'm all over the place. There's so many different things going on. But on the floor of, uh, of Congress, we have seen some really incredible speeches being given by some unlikely folks as well. Um, that's very exciting to me. Yeah. And, and we saw the, um, no, the non mincing of words, right? We're not talking. This is not a, a, a clash or a or whatever terminology the mainstream media likes to use because there's such an imbalance of power. Mm -hmm. And that's not objective. I'm sorry, that's not subjective. Like you, it, it is a fact. You cannot see what is going on and the funding that's being provided to the Israeli government. And just to your point, like it's stones and rocks versus bombs in the Iron Dome, you know? Iron and it's, Dome, you, you well, just can't even compare. I think many of us have seen the map of just how how much of the land has been taken um, over the last you know, 50, 60 years, more actually at this point. Um, so little is left. It, how do you, I, this is this is this is basically an, so you know asking the ultimate question: What's the solution to this conflict? Two state solutions, kind of like it's almost comical at this point. This is mm -hmm. this is not nineteen ninety eight. This is this is two thousand twenty one, and Netanyahu is has really become a strong, I mean, he's, he's, he's acting out for many reasons um, that we've talked about on the show, but where do you go from there? How do you, how do you reestablish land? I mean, is there a path forward? I, I mean, it's, it's, I think there absolutely is a path forward. And first and foremost, Palestinian people have to have the right of self-determination. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I even, every time I go back home to see my family, I get detained for hours on end. I'm an American citizen. I was born in the United States. My parents are immigrants. I get detained for hours on end and they do not care that I am an American citizen. Mm. 
and and I'm Palestinian. That's that's all that matters. An outspoken Palestinian at that. So they especially don't really care for me. But they love you. Um, so and it's a thousand times worse all day, every day for people living in the occupied territories who are just trying to, yeah. you know, get to work, go to the doctor, take their kids to school, all of these kinds of things, and they are treated like cattle. Um, and and at any given day, at the whim of the IDF, the checkpoint gate might change. They'll close them all down except for one. Right. They, you know, strip searches are regular are regularly happen. I mean, the abuse and the, the 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 brutality that is experienced on a daily basis is it's inhumane. Yeah. And you know, and then the, there's all the propaganda around it. I actually had somebody say to me, oh, you know, outside the West Bank, there's a sign that says Israelis enter at your own risk. That sign is written in English to deter tourists from going to the yeah. West Bank. Yeah. And it is so, it's so blatant, but also so clever. You know what I mean? And, and they don't want to see, they don't want people to see Palestinian people yeah. just living their lives as human beings, just like everybody else is trying to. They want it to be this scary place where it's violent and all of those kinds of things. And it's just not true. And I'm saying that not from, from anything except for my own firsthand experience. My family is still there. We go, I mean, in the before times, obviously pre-COVID, we go there. We still have a family home there. We still have a family all over the country. And it is just, um, it, it's really, really insulting. Uh, and I think the first step to absolutely has to be humanity, just the humanity that, that has not been afforded to Palestinian people since 1948 has to be the first and, and foremost. Anya, thanks for joining us today. Ronnie Patrice. <laughs> Thanks for having me. We appreciate your your honesty and your, uh, you know, it's, it's very personal. So I hope your family stays well and safe and um, talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. We will be right back to talk about a new pack in town. There's a new pack in town. It's like an Eagle song. Uh, we'll be right back to talk about this new pack that is targeted at uh, supporting progressives and progressive measures in state legislatures. Don't forget our state legislatures are almost uh, entirely controlled by Republicans right now because great job, Democrats. Great job. We'll be right back with Brianna Westbrook. All right. Hey guys, um, you've heard me talk about Sunset Lake CBD a lot because I love it. I'm a total uh, Sunset Lake CBD junkie. Today, I really needed some CBD. I had my, my opening was about a rental car experience. I was like, I can't, this was my day today was I could not get a rental car at all. Uh, and I was just, you know, it was just like one of those days where you need a little CBD. Uh, Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer owned company that ships craft CBD products directly from their farm in Vermont straight to your door. And they have all types of products for everybody that help with stress, aches and pains, gummies, salves, coffee, tinctures, uh, what else? Fudge, dog biscuits now. And it comes out of a, a lotion. Um, this is originally a, a dairy farm, a Ben and Jerry's dairy farm in Vermont. And they decided to diversify and grow premium hemp. They support a $15 minimum wage and employees own the majority of the company. They also support independent media like our show and the majority report and the David Pakman show. Uh, you're supporting when you support them sustainable agriculture that also enhances rural economies and creates meaningful employment in those communities. Uh, we love CBD. We love Sunset Lake CBD in particular, Dorsey and I 
always have our own little stories about our CBD products. Um, Dorsey, what are you working on right now? What are you using right now? I mean, I'm sticking with my usuals, which are the gummies and the tincture. But um, like I said, I've got the the hemp lotion that Ooh. I've been working with, and it uh, it's it's doing the job. I I like to I like to 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 combine it with the other two. And Does it numb you? Like if you put it on your wrist or something, it's no, no it, it's it doesn't just... numb. It's just kind of like I had a crick in my neck, and I put a bunch on my neck, and then eventually everything just kind of loosened up, and you could kind of like you know. Instead of like cracking your neck like that, it just eventually yeah. just like loosened and, you know, cracked uh, on its own as I was kind of just like sitting there watching a basketball game. So anyway, that's what I'm on right now. Um, but yeah, I saw that in the Mother's Day ad. And that's why I was like, hmm, I'm going to try that. So <laughs> that's what you're on right now. That's well, the tinctures are my jam. It helps me sleep. Um, I've been sleeping very well lately to the point where I'm waking up like extraordinarily early, like as the light is coming out, which means I'm sleeping deeply because if those of you watch the show know I have major sleeping issues and I have been sleeping since I've been taking this product. Like it's just gotten better and better and better. I'm like, I have my little monitor. And so I check, I had a full night's sleep last night, like not one little slice of white of tossing and turning or anything. It was like dark blue for deep sleep and like a little bit of light blue for light sleep. That is so unusual for me. I've had sleeping issues since I was a kid. So big fan of Sunset Lake CBD. You can go to sunsetlakecbd.com and enter in uh, the promo code NOMI and you get 20% off of your order at sunsetlakecbd.com. 20% off of your entire order. Type in NOMI, N-O-M-I. All right, there's a new pack in town. Brianna Westbrook, she is an executive committee member for the Arizona Democratic party she is has just launched just launched down ballot progress pack uh which is super exciting i'm i'm all about this because it's a c4 51c4 nonprofit organization uh it is dedicated to passing progressive legislation within state legislatures across the country and also organizing efforts to reshape, reshape our democracy and create a just and equal country all right brianna welcome Tell us about this pack. Uh, start, we have such a jam-packed show today. And I'm like, all these things I could talk about for hours. We're gonna have to come back on when you're doing some stuff uh, around the pack. But tell us what it is so people can check it out. Um, well, you summed it up, um, really. Uh, Down Ballot Progress is a nonprofit organization aimed at just building a volunteer base um, that could be an infrastructure to help elect progressive down ballot um, to pass uh, bold progressive legislation that um, kind of is in sync with much of the national agenda. Um, so expanding like state Medicaid uh, for Medicare for all, um, investing in renewable energy. So similar to like a Green New Deal in each state, investing in public um, free college um, and trade school, um, advocating and pushing for a living wage in each state. Um, and also really um, hitting home on some really big constitutional issues like ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment uh, and abolishing the Electoral College and getting corporate money out of politics. Um, it's a long-term um, uh, plan. As you know, this is something we want to be sustainable for years to come um, and a go-to um, organization to support progressive candidates running down ballot um, to really hold electeds accountable that are Democrats that aren't representing the will of the people, supporting those primary candidates and pushing forward that the most bold progressive agenda that we can at the state level. Because what do we know? We know that um, state legislatures are 23 times more effective um, than Congress. Uh, right now, 54% of all state legislatures are held by conservatives. Um, on average, there's a little over 125,000 bills per year across all of these state legislatures combined um, that are introduced. And that's definitely a space where we need to organize and have progressives um, winning uh, because we know that we win states, you know, it's gonna trickle up to, to federal. What um what states are you focusing on right now? Um, right now we're just getting in the launch. Um, we have a, we have a candidate in Virginia. Um, we have um, Kirshma, um, she's running for House of Delegates. Um, we have, um, like I said, we're in the very entry point. Sunday we have our big launch webinar. Um, State Senator Jabari Brisbane is gonna be speaking. Also, Arizona House Representative Asina Thalman. Um, so if you'd like to tune in and your listeners would like to tune in to hear more, that would be a really great event. 
um, to tune in to, to have a, a bigger um, conversation about down ballot progress and have more of an understanding of, of the work we're doing. Fantastic. Um, is this like the counter to the Koch brothers? Kind of, in a, in a, in a, in a way, yeah, uh, because the Koch brothers have been invested in states for a long time. Um, while progressives who really haven't um, been organized in that capacity. There's been a lot of organizations that have made the push um, that are doing a lot of different things like our revolution, for example, you know, they're endorsing a lot of candidates, local um, and federal. This is explicitly going to be state legislatures and the states. Um, so this is gonna fill a really huge void. When did you, what inspired you to do this and when and how? Um, well, what inspired me to do it um, is my experience running for office. Um, I decided to join this team um, about three and a half weeks ago um, because I'm like, yeah, that fills a huge void. Um, because here, you know, locally in Arizona, um, there's really not that infrastructure for progressive candidates, especially candidates that, you know, want to push really a bold agenda. Um, you know, there's a lot of different organizations, like I said, our revolution and things of that nature. There's candidate training programs like Emerge, but there's really like no like organization solely focused independently on um, recruiting, supporting, and building out an infrastructure to support down ballot candidates like this. So I'm that's like, yeah, like that's, that was that's, the that's, Democratic Party's so, job. <laughs> it's supposed to be right, um, but um, we know what, we can't count on the Democratic Party to do all the things that it needs to do. So we have to step up. You know, it's it's a shame because like that one consultant just really needs to buy their seventh home. It's, uh, it, it's, it's way more important than um, protecting your right to choose or, I mean, that's literally what's on the books today <laughs> in multiple state houses. So uh, this, is, this, is, this is the Lord's work as the evangelicals say, uh, you're doing the Lord's work. How can people help out? <laughs> Um, you can help out um, by going to downballotprogress.com, making a contribution. No contribution is too small. Um, this is an organization powered by um, working class people from across the country. No millionaires, no billionaires. Um, pitch in what you can. Um, help us build out this capacity to support candidates um, in all 50 states. We've seen a lot of the archaic bills that the Republicans have introduced. Like here in Arizona, they've been attacking voting rights. They did it in Florida. It's all over the country. Um, and these are areas where we need to win in 2022 and 2021, because there's some elections. Um, so pitch in there, downballotprogress.com. Um, you'll find our, our link to our Mobilize uh, event um, on there as well. If you click on the events tab, um, RSVP for the upcoming um, event on Sunday, it's at 7.30 Eastern time. Um, tune in, hear some really great voices um, and, and get some more clarity on down ballot progress and what you can do to get involved and step up and volunteer. Fantastic. All right. I love it. Down ballot progress. My cup of tea. I'm loving it, Brianna. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for sharing this. Thanks for doing the work. And, you know, we got to go local. I mean, just, it's hard to believe that just a few years ago, people weren't even going local, but look what happens. Driver is it's perfect because he was part of that, uh, that movement in New York where people didn't even know we had you know, everyone thought it was a democratic state and they didn't realize that there were eight Democrats literally caucusing with Republicans holding up progress. So Jabari is a big part of that. Uh, good, good get there. Thank you, Brianna. We're gonna go check it out and um, keep up the amazing work. Cool. Thank you for all that you do. All right, we'll be right back with our amazing panel to talk about all of the crazy news happening around the world today. Julia Doubleday is here and so is Simon Rode. We will be right back after the break.
guys. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Uh, where is everybody? I don't see the panelists. What's happening? I think something's going on. There we go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I thought it was on my end. I was like, these little functions, they change the map up. All right. Julia Doubleday is the Deputy Director of Committee. Yes, Committee, which also has a show here on Mondays, 3 p.m. to 6 p.m., Eastern, obviously, because the committee program is filming all over the world. Let's we go fancy. We're just like, let's if we're going to do international, we're going to like do real international. Uh, very exciting. You guys had your third episode out this week. Go check it out. You can see it in retrospect. Retrospect. Sure. That's what that's English. Um, Julia was also the campaign manager for Julie Oliver's congressional campaign in Texas. And she also was on Bernie Sanders's campaign and Beto O'Rourke's campaign. Uh, to name a few. And Simon Rhodes, speaking of Bernie Sanders, listen, we keep it in the fam here. It's pretty obvious to keep it in the fam. Uh, Simon was an organizer for Bernie 2020, and he is a socialist writer and producer here. And just P.S., he's a Pokemon champion. You may see that award in the oh, background. Wow. That yeah, is some congrats. real stuff. And isn't Pokemon back in the news for some reason? This is going to tie into our Chile conversation. Oh. The Pikachu, who won a, won a place uh to help write the new constitution of chile sorry i'm not i don't mean to laugh but i like don't understand what's going she on. Uh, she's a leftist so we like her she wears a pikachu costume and she got famous for kind of going around and being pikachu at rallies and stuff wait dorsey <laughs> it, I don't, if it's not too hard can we find a photo of that because i need context around this <laughs> a little bit all right let's just move right into chile because this is this is, I was at a dinner party. I was at a dinner party last night. It was a very leftist dinner party with all people who were vaccinated. Um, but to be fair, there, there were amazing leftist leaders here in Puerto Rico who've been in the leftist movement for generations or in, the, you know, years and years. And the talk of the night was Chile. <laughs> and I was Absolutely, like, yeah. I need to understand more. Um, so let's start with Julia and then we'll get to the Pikachu on it in a second. <laughs> what happened? What's going on in Chile? Is yes. Pinochet, is it, is so, the ghost of Pinochet like deep in the grave? Is is it is it done? He's spinning. He's spinning around in his grave for sure. Um, so yeah, we really have to take it back to the seventies and eighties to understand the importance of this referendum. Uh, what's you know, a referendum? Let's start with the basics. <laughs> okay. All right. That so um, in Chile. Uh, last year, they voted with by a very large majority, um, almost 80 percent of people voted of voters uh, decided that they want to rewrite the Chilean constitution, which obviously is something that doesn't happen very much in politics. Uh, you know, imagine in this country if we just by vote decided, OK, we're going to kind of over the old one. So we're going to rewrite it. Now, Chile has had about eight or nine constitutions, but this one uh, very right wing uh, constitution that protects uh, corporate entities was written under Pinochet. So uh, yesterday, or actually, sorry, in the last week, there was an election to determine who's going to help write that constitution. And what we saw was that the political establishment was very roundly rejected in that election. And the majority of delegates that are going to rewrite the constitution are leftists and independents. So people who aren't right now currently in power in the government. So this is a huge shock to the sort of Chilean powers that be. Wow. Okay. So, but, but sorry, Simon, what, what kind of leftist you see Pikachu costume, but like there really <laughs> is a crazy, I mean, it's, I, I love it. I'm like, you embrace yourself, sisters and brothers and, and all who, oh, there we go. There, there we go. There she is. Our new champion. So this <laughs> is Thomas? helping to write the, the new Chilean constitution. Yes. She no, will estamos be. En guerra, estamos unidos. We're not in a war. We're united. Okay. Um, I love it. It's a peaceful Pikachu. It's a peaceful Simon. Pikachu. What does uh, this it, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why she wears the Pikachu. I, I we would have to actually ask her about that. But she did basically become kind of this viral meme because she was going around, you know, dancing and going to rallies and giving out her info. And um, yeah, she got she won her election, so she will be part of authoring this new constitution. Uh, and in order for uh, the constitution. In order for things to go into the constitution, two thirds of the delegates have to agree. So with the majority of them being on the left and being independents, it's looking it like- we'll really never good. agree on anything. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, 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 that too. Be careful what you wish for. When the majority is on the left, um, we're gonna be fighting over 
always, always fighting, <laughs> always fighting. Um, but yeah, so next year, 2022, the drafted constitution, hopefully it will exist uh, and it will get voted on by the public again, if they want to accept or reject the constitution drafted by uh, these delegates, including the Pikachu. Wow. Simultaneously, <laughs> there is a, um, the, the mayor of Santiago is a communist. So this is very Word. exciting. Simon, you come from the central, uh, I think it's, it's, it's the underground communist community is above ground where you live in Portland. How do you feel? I'm trying to find a link other than Pikachu. <laughs> I don't want to be like to our Pikachu correspondent. <laughs> um, I didn't plan this guys. I did not. <laughs> wow. I, yet I am very interested in, um, what's going on in Chile. And actually, Julia, I kind of want to ask you, so I, I, my understanding is there are 155 people who are on this committee, right? Yeah, it's a, I think you're right. It's 100 something. I might have it in my notes, but yeah, I think it's a, I'm sure you're right, 155, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know, I just like looked at an article. Right <laughs> I'm curious about um, like how many people were running and how they were able to build like, w w was there like an organization in place? Like, were, was there like leftist organizations that were helping endorse? Yeah, so the political party structure in Chile is a lot different than here. So um, it's not really like two major parties warring against each other. And there, there are a lot of factions that sort of come together. So there's um, something called the Broad Front, which is basically a collection of like five or six lefty parties, because as Nomiki was just saying, we can't really get along that well. So we constantly, you know, in a lot of places, the left is constantly fracturing into parties, but then also coming together in coalitions when it looks like um, they can win. So there has been infighting between a lot of those parties over the last few years, which is why right now in Chile, there's a far right Republican billionaire uh, president in Chile, not Republican, but you know, Republican-ish billionaire businessman president. So um, again, this was a, a, a real shock. I mean, I think part of the issue is likely, uh, the COVID crisis, you know, all over the world, we've seen that, um, right wing oh. and authoritarian governments are having trouble holding on to their support or holding on to power as, um, that was handled so badly all over the world. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a variety of different parties, tons of different candidates, uh, it's not it's not one for one, but what we're seeing is that they did manage to bring out their people, whereas the right wing did not. That's great. Um, I, go ahead, I was, go ahead, Simon. Oh, I, I, every time I hear stories like this of like, um, like I, I always feel like if there's a story of some kind of uh, leftist group seizing like some kind of political power uh, or winning a major election, it's often in uh, like Central or South America, um, we and I'm, I'm always very interested in how that happens there and what are the barriers to something like that happening here um i you know i just based off what you were just talking about it sounds like our two-party system would be a big block um to people infiltrating that space uh, yeah i mean oh go ahead Namiki. You know, if you have been, thoughts but about there's it. always like a a there was there was part of the reason they cracked down was there was such a strong foundation of leftist organizing for, for decades. And so right. to the, to my point, sorry to be Debbie, Debbie Downer, how are they gonna try to crush them now? Yeah, um, so this, this I think it is important to actually get this context of, of Pinochet coming to power. So, um, you know, Salvador Allende, one of the most, he was the first Marxist ever elected president in Latin America. Um, when he was elected, you know, there was just this really vibrant left um, in, in Chile. And he was in office for three years before uh, the rich people collaborated with the CIA to overthrow him. So imagine, imagine basically someone to the left of Bernie Sanders getting elected, and then three years from now, the military is bombing the White House. So that's what happened in Chile. They were they bombed the presidential palace. Uh, Allende was killed in the fighting. We, we think he actually shot himself after giving this last speech that he was never going to resign. Uh, very dramatic, horrific um, ending to, to his uh, administration, which had been nationalizing the, co the copper mines, nationalizing the banks, nationalizing. That's why it always gets you in trouble. If you start nationalizing things, people start paying attention to what you're doing. They don't really like it. The US starts to get involved. Rich people start to get involved. They're, 
uh, you know, began cracking down on the economy to try to weaken, um, you know, the effectiveness of the regime. So after this bombing of the presidential palace and uh, the death of Yande, Pinochet comes into power. And this is, of course, you know, the beginning of decades of repression, brutal repression, murdering leftist activists, about 3000 socialist communist leftists were killed by Pinochet or disappeared. Um, he's sort of because of this, like a real folk hero to Nazis, you know, like if they don't, they don't want to come out and say, I love Hitler, they'll often wear t-shirts or things because people don't know as much about Pinochet, like Pinochet did nothing wrong, you know, like, so if you ever see that, that's just crazy Nazis, uh, saying that we should kill all the leftists. And, and they also <laughs> moved down there. Let's just be clear. The oh, crazy yes, Nazis yes. were just like, oh, we're just going to sneak away and go to South America yes. and fit in. <laughs> um, and so this new constitution that they wrote under Pinochet, let me, I actually have a quote here that I think is really important. Um, one of the authors, his name is Jaime Guzman. He said the constitution imposed in 1980 was destined to rule Chilean society in perpetuity. If our adversaries ever come to power, they will see for themselves, they will see themselves forced to follow an action not so different from the one we would have wished for. So in other words, they knew they might not always be able to hold on to power through the military, but they wrote the constitution so that yeah. you can't really change too much, you know, like mm -hmm. economically, uh, the ensuing administrations were still very limited in what they could change about, um, you know, the ability for resources to be privatized, for example. So water is super privatized in Chile. This constitution is super anti-indigenous. Um, one of the first things that happened after um, Allende was killed is that a lot of the landowners who had had their land redistributed to native populations went out and killed all the Mapuche natives in the area and took their land back. Um, so this is all happening in the context of like, there was this really fantastic uh, leftist movement watched around the world and it was just crushed, uh, crushed and destroyed. And now finally the Chilean public has this opportunity to get rid of this atrocious constitution. It's amazing. Um, I don't wanna shift gears because this is such a fascinating topic, but there, uh, what's happening in Colombia now, the alternative is uh, to, to, to the hope in Chile is what's happening in Colombia. And uh, we've covered this a little bit on the show. Uh, Simon, I think you were on when we were covering uh, the day that the 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 um, helicopters were, the Black Hawk helicopters initially provided by the US at some point, um, were just slaughtering people in a square, in a, in a park. Um, let's, let's, hang on, we have a, yes. So, the protests are continuing, and actually one of the rebel leaders, a former uh, Colombian rebel leader, was killed in Venezuela because it was a, a FARC uh, leader was killed there. So this is, again, like all of this is rooted in in the politics, the Reagan-esque before, but, but, but Reagan-era politics in particular. It never went away. And so, I, you know, I was really surprised to see that our not only, I mean, Israel, we provide the most uh, resources to, but Colombia is number two. So these two crises, we've, we've talked about Palestine for a good chunk of the show already, but these two crises are happening simultaneously as Joe Biden, who was the chair of the Foreign Services Committee, um, vice president, of course, had conflicting uh, perspectives on a lot of foreign policy, conflicting with, with Hillary Clinton, who was going even more right wing than um, she's like, you know, Margaret Thatcher, basically, uh, as 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 uh, as our secretary of state. And Joe Biden was towing like sort of the neoliberal line. And all of this stuff is blowing. All these crises are blowing up. Poor use of words, but blowing up at the same time when the neoliberals have, I mean, the, the writing has been on the wall for a long time, but Trump and this rise of fascism has seemed to spark just such an aggressive response that it seems like Joe Biden and the neoliberals have no ability to respond to that because that's not really what they were set up to do. They were set up to kind of like neoliberal way, their, their way out of the right wing of the eighties and, and earlier into like whatever they want to call stability, but now that's led to a, a bigger spark. Is, is that, does that make sense? I'm giving a very like basic analysis here of the world, but um, I mean, let's, Julia, just, just to get your sense to, to pivot off of what we were saying before, how much of what's happening in Columbia right now is rooted in the eighties? 
Yeah. I mean, I think what you're talking about is a thing that we really, it's really the focal point of our show, the committee program, um, because in the same way that corporate actors don't acknowledge national boundaries, yeah. it's also true that right-wing authoritarian governments and capitalist interests, they don't really have the same kind of restrictions that individuals and organizers on the left do. So they generally, um, they have a worldview that has been totally dominant since the 1980s, 90s. You mentioned Reagan, you mentioned Thatcher. Um, the writing of this constitution in Chile uh, actually, one of the people who helped write it was Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman came down to Chile to write the Chilean Constitution and Water Rights Code um, because this is what the right wing wanted. They wanted to enshrine uh, the right to privatization and deregulation of all of these formerly publicly held resources. So all over uh, the world, you can see the fallout from that, the fallout from policies that were made 30, 40 years ago, because we're living through these really massive um, crises that are the direct result of decades of deregulation and decades of privatization. Basically, these people thought the money train's never going to run out. We're just going to do whatever we want. We're going to keep putting more money in our pockets. We're going to keep taking these resources. It's never going to go wrong. And now it's 2021 and things are really going wrong. People are really fed up with the fact that economic inequality is so brutally bad. They're fed up with uh, having to contend with major disasters constantly, where it's pretty clear that our governments aren't doing anything to help people, you know, like with COVID-19 the government really fell down. Our government, the Brazilian government, the Colombian government, all of these governments did not care about individuals. They cared about protecting their economy. They cared about um, protecting the investment environment. Actually, today in Bloomberg, there was a headline that was like, well, um, investors are fleeing from Chile because they're going to write a constitution that says indigenous people have rights. So, uh, when oh you, my God. Yeah, so, when you have an economic system that rewards uh, the exploitation of people, and the exploitation of the environment. And it actually punishes if you try to protect people uh, and that's global, what you end up with is a system that is just massively predatory and uh, over time um, leaving people in a place where they're going to go one way or another. So I think all over the world, we're seeing this, what people call um, radicalization, but polarization. I don't totally like that word, but polarization, mm -hmm. um, meaning that people are becoming more right wing or more left wing. And essentially the reason for that is that we know that the status quo can't continue. We all are aware of that. So um, there's one group of people that say we got to massively change things, people on the left. And there's one group of people on the right that say, look, I like the way things are. So if maintaining things the way they are means that we have to, you know, have eugenicist policies and close our doors to immigrants and blame other poor people for things that rich people are doing, then we're going to do that. So that's how capitalism ultimately devolves into fascism. Because over time, without authoritarianism, people get fed up with being dispossessed. Um, and the way that this is playing out in Colombia, you mentioned, is that this, this was sparked from uh, this just it, it's it's almost like Netanyahu bombing journalists and thinking he can get away with it. They think in this moment it's totally going to be fine. How yeah. out of touch are you to to put the taxes on working people? And I mean, to this, the, this is just it's almost iconic. It's 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 like such a metaphor for the failures of the establishment that they think they can get away with this. Simon, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I love what, what Julia was just talking about, that that connection between um, like neoliberal politics leading towards fascism um, in, the, in capitalism specifically leading towards fascism is I think a really important piece for us to understand here in the United States, uh, but all around the world. Um, and yeah, something has to change, you know, and, and, it's, and it's our politicians not just our politicians, but obviously the, the politicians in Colombia being completely out of touch with what's going to play well um, in you know when people are economically really desperate. Um, yeah. 
And so, I think that's what's happening with Biden right now is it's like he knows he's he can't be out of touch. So he's doing kind of like he's frozen in a sense, but he's doing I mean, he's a, he's a beat or two or five slow. But there are moments he does make up for it because there are people around him probably LeBron Klain, who are like, you got to do it. Like, we're looking at Twitter. <laughs> it's not looking good, buddy. You got to do something. And then they have their conference calls with all their donors. Like, How far can I go? How, what, what is, what is the most I can say? Tell me, yeah. what, what can I do? It is all, it's like exactly that. It's walking that line. And this, that's why it's like this, this, uh, like people are like, oh, Twitter's not real life, but like public sentiment is real life. You know, like that yeah. does, like, Biden would not be, you know, doing the things that we do appreciate that the Biden administration has done wouldn't be there if it weren't for the public um, politics shifting. And also the crisis. There's a point where they also just have to spend the money because, you know, how bad it's going to get worse. They're going to have Hoovervilles. I mean, they're just like the eviction crisis, which I've talked about a million times. We don't know the state of evictions in this country. We're literally just living in a bubble Mm -hmm. thinking, it's all the, the economic recovery is going to happen unless they eliminate the debt from 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 the, the the rent debt, and not to mention a million you know small businesses, etc. We have no sense of what the actual exodus is going to be for many cities. We have no sense at this point. So it's just like there's this facade. They're like, well, we're going to deal with the low hanging fruit first, the major crises, and the next major crisis. But while they're doing that, there's all these global crises. So it's it's he's drowning in crises, and it's. I think with Colombia, I mean, you said it's funny they think they can get away with this. I think the thing we have to keep in mind, too, is just that generally over the last like 50, 60 years, the most important thing, again, is protecting markets. So like with Pinochet, he's this horrible authoritarian military leader. um, But there's this idea of like this free market miracle of Chile where everyone was just um, printing cash down there. And, you know, again, when we talk about the economic success of these places, we're not actually talking about the economic success of all the people there. We're talking about the economic success of a few people. So generally when people talk about a place being stable and being a good investment, they mean that rich people can come down there with money and make more money. And that's the number one priority of global capitalism. So, Mm-hmm. For the last few decades, it really has been the U.S. and our allies turning a blind eye. You can be authoritarian if it means that we're still making money. If we're not making money, then we might come in and, you know, maybe have a different opinion about who you wanted to vote for than, than maybe you, you saw yourself uh, voting for. So in a lot of places, they have gotten away with this kind of brutal repression because, again, the U.S. bills itself as this human rights sort of um, watchdog, but it's- Democracy broker. It's, right, That's it's all the, quite related to our economic interests, which is yeah. similar to any other empire that ever existed. I mean, it's sort of this bizarre idea that that it would act different than any other, you know, powerful, powerful country that has existed before it. So yeah, yeah it, it defends its economic interests is Julia, what it does. The, like you're, you're talking about the, you know, the US turning a blind eye to you know, oppression and is, but it's also sometimes the U.S. playing a very active role. Like, did it, mm, yeah. Biden, didn't the not United States work with um, the Pinochet government in like yes. the Operation Condor and like the violence that happened around that? Yeah. So um, there's actually a really great book um, that came out last year, Jakarta Method by Vincent Bevan. Yeah, he's been on the show. It's a phenomenal awesome. Book. Yes, I love him. Um, and in the Jakarta method, I thought it was really interesting because he talked through how um, this uh, process that they went through in order to overthrow the democratically elected uh, government there was repeated, then repeated around the world. So it was a sort of laboratory of anti-communism. And in Chile, when uh, Allende was wildly popular, Uh, the right wing was writing Jakarta and Jakarta is coming like on the walls, like as graffiti. And it was this warning to the left of like, you know, the CIA isn't going to put up with this. They're going to get you. They're going to get your ass. So ultimately, you know, Ayande, if he had a weakness, again, we talk about the left infighting. Ayande was really reluctant to use the power of the state to crack down on these people. You know, he said, we're a democracy. We have a democratic process. I'm not going to, you know, arrest my political opponents. 
I don't think it's going to become, you know, I don't think they're going to do anything. And meanwhile, other parts of the left were kind of, you know, stockpiling weapons and stuff. Uh, and ultimately he was killed, you know, he was killed believing in the democratic process. Um, and it's a really sad story. And actually if I could just add one more thing about him. Um, there's a really common protest chant that you hear sometimes. We were just going to actually, it's so funny. Somebody uh, messaged us about that. But go oh, ahead, please. Yes. No, it's funny. Okay, they were like, so save, yeah. Yeah, the People United Will Never Be Defeated, which was um, this folk song that then turned into sort of like the campaign theme of a Yonde, and they would chant uh, this chant uh, when he was being elected and then even after he was overthrown. So sometimes I hear that at American uh, protests and it's very emotional. I just think like, you know, he was overthrown, but the, his his legacy lives on. And when you hear that, you know, I always think of, of him and the work that the Chilean left in. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. Perfect. I can't. I can't speak Spanish at all, I so it's, like I would either. just butcher it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I wish we could talk about this for like an hour longer. But you know what you can do is you can go check out the committee program on Mondays, three yes. p.m. to six p.m. Yeah. It is a beautifully produced show. I'm in all of your work uh, on the ground, yeah. everywhere. It's it's amazing. So love this family that we're creating here. Um, I love it. Too. I highly recommend everybody who's watching the show today to definitely go check out the committee program. I've been I've been loving it every Oh Monday. yay, anyway. love that. <laughs> <laughs> go awesome. check it out. Uh, subscribe. Right. You're also on fans.fm uh, yes. slash the committee program, I think, or committee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's in our it's just go into Yeah, that. and we have a Patreon as well now. Patreon. Okay. Yes. Patreon. <laughs> Patreon? I don't know. It's Patreon. I don't know. Okay. I only I don't no other languages for me, just English. It's, it's all on the um in the description so you guys can check it out all right guys thank you so much i'm going to do some uh, quick shout outs in our super chats here we go tokyo thank you, buddha you. thank you uh says yo nomi you ever eaten at shopsons any favorite restaurants in new york city oh my god Dude, that could be an entire show nomi's favorite restaurants in new york city if they still are around before covid i took like a long walk through specifically manhattan and because i used to live in the lower east side and I walked by, th I, went, I wanted to go to three different restaurants that were my favorite. It was a ramen place, a Thai restaurant. I forgot what the other one was. Um, I think it was an Italian place. And they didn't exist anymore. This is, and it was like within a, this is before COVID. So I'm, I'm, I've already seen many of my favorite restaurants uh, shut down. I stay mostly in my neighborhood in Astoria now, um, which I shouldn't say out loud, but uh, I, 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 yeah, plenty. I've been to shops since, yes. Um, plenty of favorite restaurants, but I don't know. That's a whole show. We should just do show, a sh just like we could do, we could film the show at different restaurants in New York. What do you think, Dorsey? You have favorite restaurants, I'm sure. I gotta go. Oh my God. I was asked to uh, throw your hat in the ring again, Nomi. Okay, good luck. Uh, Ken, thank you so much, Jack Daly, for that. Uh, Ken M sends his love. Thank you so much. Marty Hunt says, I called my rep from, from Texas, Veronica Escobar. And even though I know they won't respond, but Ted Cruz and John Cornyn, uh, to stop the sale to Israel, just make those calls, make or shame them. Sh you know, find the Democrats, find find the ones that are like in the progressive caucus. You don't have to be part of their, you know, constituency to do so. Prairie Fire Kowalski, thank you for the love. Ian Kinzel says, how would you suggest reaching Dem voters in your family who only watch MSNBC and think Dems need to stay centrist to win elections? Help, please. Uh, start with human rights. Like, I don't know. I mean, those are always the ones who, who they showed up at Black Lives Matter protests, but Money is always a big one, showing them where the money's coming from. Um, what does centrist mean? Like, that's what I always say. Does centrist mean they take corporate money? Because most voters don't vote on corporate money. Uh, yeah, that's I, that's a big conversation. That's a nice topic for a show, too. Chomsky Video says, what happens if GOP officials with no respect for election outcomes get in a position where they are legally the ones who will count votes and will certify the election? Would the army need to come and force them to appoint a neutral body to count votes and certify the election worried about january 6 thanks um yeah so there are states that that kind of is happening um it's a little bit more complicated i think they have to have a balance based on the, the legislatures depending on the state some of them are independent commissions uh arizona right now the big fight in arizona is over the vote count and that's one of the reasons why people are inflamed over it is it's not representative of <clears throat> obviously what, what the voters wanted this is this is happening in every, this is why state legislatures legislatures matter. This is why gerrymandering matter, matters. This is why Democrats have to invest their money on the ground because 
This is exactly uh, what goes down. Yeah, worried about January 6, 2025. I'm worried about January 6, 2021 and how we seem to have forgotten that there was a, uh, a, a coup to overthrow the government and kill the vice president. And people are just like, yeah, anyways. All right. Thank you to everyone. Oh, we have one more scroll. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay. Uh, Jay Create says, gracias, no me el show. Hoy fue muy interesante. Grande show, grande chat, grande mods. <laughs> Moderators, did I miss any other ones? Oh, I did. No, I didn't. Hang on. Am I missing more? Oh, I got them all. Thank you, Dorsey. All right. Much love to our moderators. Much love to everybody helping fight those algorithms. We will see you tomorrow. Keep those trolls, those spaces troll free. Thank you to Dorsey. Thank you to Simon. Thank you to our entire team, to all of our guests today. We'll see you tomorrow live at 3 p.m. on YouTube and on Twitch. And then uh, you can check us out at patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Stay in solidarity. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. The No Miki Show. Thank you.